Hello, everyone. Thanks for taking the time to join us today for the webinar titled When Digital Meets Physical, Effective Congress Lions. My name is Chris Rodriguez. I'm the Senior Director of Marketing here at phone to action First, uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us, but first I want to walk through a few housekeeping items. We will be live tweeting the event using the hashtag AdvocacyFlyIn. We invite you to follow along and contribute and tag at phone to action on Twitter and Instagram. You have two choices for how to listen to this event, over your computer speakers or by dialing in over the phone. If you run into problems with your computer's audio, please call into the number provided by GoToWebinar. Next, we are recording this event and we'll be sending the link to all registrants along with the slide deck after the webinar has ended. And finally, after the presentation, we will have some time for questions. To submit a question for us, please type your question into the questions box on your control panel. If you run into any technical difficulties during today's presentation, please contact us via the chat window and I will assist you. Now I'd like to introduce Eric Rosedahl, Head of Alliances and Stakeholder Impact at Phone to Action. Eric, I'll hand it over to you to kick us off. Great, thank you, Chris. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody th this afternoon. We have a fantastic panel of professionals from major trade groups, from nonprofits, and, corpor and a cor great corporation. Um, and they're all experts on running successful fly-ins in the in Washington, here in Washington and in state capitals. So just to, uh, to get started, I want to go over the agenda very quickly. Uh, we're going to do a quick round of introductions, and then we're going to talk about uh, fly-in best practices. Then we'll go into case studies, which will go really deeper and really expand on how to, to have a successful fly-in. And then we'll take time at the end for your questions. So um, please, as we go along, please Feel free to ask questions as we go along, or ask questions at the the end of the uh, at the end of the webinar today. Great, so let's get going here. So our first panelist that I'm going to introduce is Brittany Meyer, Senior Associate Director of Public Policy of the Michael J. Fox Foundation for Parkinson's Research. Brittany, can you tell us about your responsibility at the Michael J. Fox Foundation and how you got into advocacy? Um, sure. Hi, everybody. Um, so my name is Brittany Meyer, um, as was said, and I work at the foundation um, in policy, where I focus on science-related issues for the foundation. Um, and I also work with our funded researchers in a grassroots, a grassroots manager type capacity. Um, I assisted in my first Hill Day in 2010 and have been running them uh, since 2014 for, this will be my third organization where I've run Hill Days. Um, and I got into advocacy after law school, um, mostly because I did not want to be a practicing attorney. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Thank you, Brittany, and we're glad you're here. Our next panelist is Carlene Pickard. She's the Ethical Campaign Specialist at Lush Fresh Handmade Cosmetics. Carlene, could you please tell us about your portfolio at Lush and, and how did you get into advocacy? Sure. Um, good morning, everyone. I guess depending on where you are, I'm here on the sunny West Coast. Uh, we, um, you know, I am. I, I work for Lush North America, and we're based here out of Vancouver in Canada. And um, we have 250 stores in North America. About 200 of those are in the U.S. And I sit on the charitable giving team, but the job I do is actually coordinate and put together the campaigns that we run in our shops about issues that we care about. So from time to time, when we're not talking about Mother's Day or Christmas or Valentine's Day, um, if you're in a shop or online, you'll see certain um, issue, certain issues showing up that we want to take a stand on, whether that's calling for the abolition of the death penalty, fighting animal testing, or... Um, calling for, you know, a safe welcome of refugees from Syria. So we um, run these campaigns. We also do, and, and you know, what we found Phone to Action Tool really helpful with um, is that we engage a lot of folks online and in the stores to send messages to their elected representatives. I spent about 20 years working for nonprofits before I came to Lush um, in all sorts of capacities from international human rights to kind of grassroots local organizing all across the country. Great. So welcome, 
Carlene. Our next panelist is Christine Prather, and she's the Director of State Grassroots Programs for the Credit Union National Association. Christine, can you talk about your portfolio and, and how did you get into advocacy? Good afternoon, everyone, for those of us on the East Coast. Um, my name is Kristen, and I usually go by KP, so if you hear anyone from CUNA mentioning KP, that's me. Um, as the State Director of Grassroots Programs, I manage our state-level advocacy campaigns, but I also have a hand in all of our digital advocacy campaigns at the federal level. Um, I got into advocacy because it was a little more of a stable job environment from working on political campaigns, which is where I originally started. So having steady benefits and steady work is how I ended up doing advocacy in trade association land because every day is a new campaign. Great. Thanks, KP. <laughs> Our next panelist is Zoe Aldrich, who is the advocacy organizer and pol for policy and advocacy at the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. Zoe, can you talk about your portfolio and, 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 what, and how you got into advocacy? Sure thing. Um, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, I guess. Um, my name is Zoe Aldrich. Um, I work at the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. Um, for those of you who might not be aware, uh, cystic fibrosis, or CF, it's a rare life-threatening genetic disease. Um, impacts about 30,000 people in the US. So my job is to engage the CF community, so both people with CF and then their care teams, family members, friends, et cetera, um, and engaging in policy work on both the state and federal level. So I help to oversee the planning and execution of the foundations. Uh, we do two large federal fly-ins every year, as well as a handful of smaller events at state capitals. So um, in addition to using tools like Phone to Action in our community organizing um, digitally, um, we also use it to help build our networks and make sure that we're engaging folks um, across the country at all different levels of government on issues that impact our community, so largely healthcare work. Um, I've been been working in advocacy and communi community organizing um, my entire career thus far in a variety of topics, um, though my parents would tell you that I started in advocacy work at a very young age when I was very insistent on writing letter to the editors um, to our local papers. So this is it for me. <laughs> That's great. Well, thanks, Zoe, and welcome. All right. Well, let's get let's get let's roll up our sleeves and get going here uh, this, this afternoon or this morning if you're in the West Coast. Um, so we've got we're going to talk about the best practices first for a fly-in. Really, you know, uh, I, what I like to say is kind of the four pillars, you know, of, of a successful fly-in. It's making a plan, preparing your advocates, maximizing your impact when they're at the fly-in, and maintaining momentum after the fly-in or during the fly-in. So I'd like to ask, um, you know, my panelists to th this afternoon is, is you know, the first thing is is, is really – you know, working with the steering committee and the members or your or your or your supporters. You know, how do you get buy-in or how do you how do, how does it how did do, how does it start? Um, KP, could you could you kind of kick it off for us? On you know, when you when you start planning, how do you how do you start getting folks in, engaged and involved? So one of the first things we do when we start planning our annual fly-in is working with our state associations to figure out what their um, main issues are or main priorities for their credit union members. And once we have figured out what those priorities are, be they data security or um, looking at housing finance reform, we take those opinions and what people think, and that's how we start to formulate our policy for the Governmental Affairs Conference, which is our largest fly-in. So the first thing we always do is work with our members to figure out what do they want to experience when they come to the fly-in, what do they want to learn, and most importantly, what issues do they want to present to the legislators when they go up on the hill. Great, cool. Zoe, do you do you have anything? You know, when you when you guys start planning. Uh, you know, how do you, how do you guys start putting the policies or, or, or talking to your members or, you know, get going? 
Yeah, definitely. So the policy and advocacy team here at the CF Foundation um, sat down a number of years ago and put together um, what we call our policy priorities list, right? These are the metrics by which we evaluate any healthcare proposal um, to see how it impacts the CF community, right? So in the last couple of years, we've been talking a lot about, obviously, um, healthcare and healthcare reform, um, both the state and federal level. So we evaluate every policy based on whether or not it will ensure that people with cystic fibrosis have access to adequate and affordable health care. Um, so using that metric, that's how we pick these specific issues that we weigh in on. Um, so obviously in 2017, we were doing a lot of work at the federal level um, about the various proposals that were put forward um, about the Affordable Care Act and potentially repealing or replacing it. Um, but we also do a lot of work around uh, state budgets, around funding for specific um, programs that assist people with CF afford their care in the various states or, you know, larger policies that impact Medicaid or, uh, you know, the individual insurance markets, things like that. Great. Um, Brittany, do you have, at the Michael J. Fox Foundation, do you have any, you know, secrets or how, or how you guys start planning or getting your members or your supporters ready or, or with their policy or how does that all work? Um, sure. At the at the Fox Foundation, we um, with issues we've gathered issues from a variety of sources. We've done surveys to patients and uh, to our researchers. Um, I'll talk a little bit more in detail about how we function, but um, we have two hill days, basically one for researchers and one for patients. Um, and then as far as how we get participants, both of our events have an application process. So we have we put out a call to to folks saying that we're having our hill day and we have them apply um, with information about what they've done in the past on advocacy, why they're interested. Um, we pay uh, for people to come, um, or for a large majority of people to come, and so uh, it's a little bit of a, a sponsorship kind of um, you know they get a benefit by by joining us. Uh, so sure. we then take the applications and um, review them and. Um, look at uh, geographical diversity. We want people from all over the country. Um, we want to have different age ranges for the researcher hill day, which I'm going to focus on. We want to have people yep. different career levels um, and that kind of thing. So we try to um, make it diverse, but also we'll look at people's responses and and see um, you know why they're interested in coming to advocate with us. That's great, and I guess. Um, Carlene, you, you're on a little bit different side because you're not you're not a nonprofit and you're not a trade association. Um, how do you guys? Is it do you do you have multiple issues when you're doing a fly-in, or do you have just one issue? How do you, how does that work? I think the you know the example that I'm going to talk about is sort of you know it would be the issue that we're probably most well known for um, in terms of fighting yeah. animal testing and, and being a cruelty-free brand. So. Um, I think over the years, we've felt that it's sort of not enough to be a company that, you know, talks about how our products are cruelty free, that we weren't seeing animal testing leaving cosmetics fast enough and, and work with a ton of really amazing nonprofits that, you know, do the whole gamut from sort of direct activism to lobbying policymakers. And so we have just you know, more recently have been diving into taking an active role around legislation um, and specifically kind of in the realm of, of bans on animal testing for cosmetics. Great. So there's already, so, you know, quite a large constituency out there in terms of the organizations that we've worked with for decades at this point on the issue. Yeah, yeah. So how how do you guys measure success? Like, you know, is it how many meetings you have? Is it, you know, is it getting co-sponsors on the bill? Like, you know, how, how, how are those goals and metrics measured? KP, can you give us some insight how you at a trade association measure success for a flying? So our biggest measure of success actually came last year when shortly after our government affairs conference, uh, we had a bill pass, S2155, which was great. But in GACs prior to that, one way we measured success was obviously in how many meetings we had. And the second yep. thing was members who were hostile to us beforehand or not the most friendly, could we get into their offices and have a good meeting? So sometimes right. your success isn't getting someone to say yes with you, but it's getting them to not say, no, get out of my office. It's 
starting to build the relationship. So we look at each yeah. individual member and figure out what does success look like for that congresswoman or that senator. Right. So on the nonprofit side, like Brittany or Zoe, like is is success getting funding or is it success getting a bill? I mean, how do you guys on the nonprofit side, Zoe, or I'll go with Zoe first, but how, how would you measure a successful flying? I would actually agree with everything that KP just said, right? It can be, okay. success can be measured in, in a broad variety of ways. Sometimes it is getting yep. funding restored to a specific program that had been, you know, zeroed out earlier in the budget process. Um, sometimes yep. it is, it definitely number of meetings is a metric that we look at. Um, but I really um, want to follow up on the point you made about uh, relationship building, right? You know, we've definitely had situations where, you know, we've had some less than friendly meetings, but um, we really try to take the long-term look and build and maintaining relationships with all members of Congress or elected officials. So being able to yep. year after year keep going back in and see an improvement in relationships um, is definitely a good metric of success for us. Brittany, do you have any, you know, how you guys measure it at the Fox Foundation? Um, yeah, I think that it's important to mostly define what you want to get out of it um, is more important than the particular metric that you use. Um, we look at meetings and, and some of the things that have been said, and then we also look at our phone to action uh, portal, and we have a goal, a very strong um, and our previously articulated goal for the number of um, supporting um, action alert responses that we yeah. want to get. Um, so we will report out on that one, but I think the main idea is, you know, make sure you have a metric. Great. And so, um, Carlene, on the corporate side, you know, how do you guys measure success? Is it is it um, passing the bill, or how, you know, what what is a successful fly-in for you guys in Sacramento or whatever um, capital you're at? Yeah, for the for Sacramento, it was definitely at a kind of important time um, for yeah, the piece yeah. of legislation that we were supporting. It was sort of the 11th hour. And so that definitely success was, you know, if it passed or did not pass. Um, I think also, you know, just echoing on the last point, we're really interested right now. And I think what Phone to Action really helps us do is we're interested in figuring out folks that are on our list as customers what the interest is there for them to become activists and so having a way to measure how many people were you know either seeing like directly convert over or actually you know just take an action and contact with their elected representative um we also like have metrics for success around that so that's that's great and i kind of want to pull at that thread a little bit um carlene and how do you like, what is a star advocate? You know, you, you've got all these folks coming in. Like, who is a star advocate for you guys? Like, who, who is it? The customer, or is it, is it an employee? Like, who, who is it? Um, I mean, it's definitely both. We know that we've got, you know, eight thousand super um, compassionate staff across the business, and giving them yep. the ability to take action um, in a, you know. I mean, arguably more meaningful way um, is is something that we're really excited about. But I think for the greater movement on whatever the issue is that we're working on, you know, both being able to say that Lush is a voice on an issue is, you know, seeming advantageous for the movement um, or, you know, that's kind of the feedback that we're getting, but also just that the numbers of customers that we have and that kind of new audience for a lot of the organizations that we're working with. Um, is just like an entirely different um, cross-section of folks. And so that experience too of customers kind of coming into a store and, you know, being turned on to an issue, being actually told that they can do something right away, um, yep. watching kind of how the, all that process, is, how all that is rolling out has been something that's really exciting because we've always known that that interest is there, but it's just actually getting folks to do stuff and, and hopefully having an impact is um, what's really jazzing us right now. Yeah. Oh, on the nonprofit side, Brittany, thank you, Carly. On the nonprofit side, Brittany, like who are your star advocates when you're on the Hill? You know, when, when you, who, who's the best voice? Um, it depends on the issue. We, we have our two constituencies, the patient and the, the researchers that we fund and that are funded by the government, usually through grants. Um, as far as individual people, you know, it, 
they kind of come to us and they really want to get involved. And anyone who's interested in getting involved, we never turn anyone away. Um, and we work very hard to cultivate uh, our champion um, advocates uh, through lots of um, education and and help. Um, but they, they mostly they show an interest. Great. And then uh, KP on the on the trade association side or on on your membership side. Who are your who are your kind of star advocates? Employees, owner, bank, you know, who uh, credit union owners, like who 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 is your key advocates or supporters of credit unions? So our star advocates are usually the frontline credit union staff. So like the tellers you see every day, or the uh, junior loan lenders, loan officers, because they have yeah. the really good stories from credit union members on a personal level. They're the ones who can yeah. go in and say, if it weren't for this lending program, Mrs. Smith wouldn't have been able to get a car to get her to her job. You know, they're yeah. the ones who have really great stories. And in, addi in addition to them, when we can get credit union members themselves to attend fly-ins, which we do during our mini fly-in days throughout the year, the members yeah. have the best stories and they're the greatest advocates because they're living proof of the credit union difference. How do you get their data when they're here? Do you do you do texting or how you know do you ask them, how do you get your email? How do you do that? Uh, we ask them for a quick registration form. So what's your first name? What's your last name? What's your email address? Home address? And which credit union do you belong to? We also work work very closely with our state associations to get that information ahead of time. But usually when we're here, it's, you know, the old networking opportunities galore of, hey, can I have your business card? And then we always try to follow up with a thank you message to keep them engaged even after they go home. Great. Okay, so I just want to close this making a plan. And can everyone just give a, a – I'm just going to do a real quick round robin question. You know, what's your best tip for scheduling uh, a, a lawmaker? Can you just in 30 seconds or a lot, you know, what, what tips do you have? Uh, Brittany, can you give me one real fast? Persistence. Persistence. Keep going. Yeah. Uh, KP. Make sure you have a constituent. That's a great tip. Yeah. Uh, Zoe. Think about who are the most strategic members of Congress for you to meet with to achieve your goals and use your phone to action list to identify interested advocates who live in those districts to get the constituent angle. Okay. Carleen, any good tips on lawmaking, lawmaker scheduling? I mean, I don't know if it's the best, but we certainly had success with having some famous people. <laughs> <laughs> Celebrity, got it. Yeah. Excellent. So, yeah. moving on is preparing your advocate. So now you got your plan. Now people are, you know, now now you got to get these folks educated. So. KP, how do you you talk about you know the, the the credit union employees? How do you educate them when before they get here to Washington or to the state capitol? One of the big things we do is we'll always hold a pre fly in conference call with anyone who will be attending our mini fly ins throughout the year. So for those which we call hike the hills, we'll have a pre call with the individual state and those attending to go over the main issues. Prior to our large 5,000 person fly in the GAC, we will create state specific briefing books that go over all of the credit union issues in our nation's capital. And we'll send those out about a week ahead of time so our attendees have an opportunity to look them over. We'll also typically do live webinars or other conference calls to give them the lay of the land. Once the GAC kicks off on the first day of the conference, we have about an hour to an hour and a half legislative and political briefing update that we give from the main stage. So we definitely make good use of that captive audience of, you know, 4,000, 5,000 people. And we sandwich yep. in a keynote speaker either before or after, as well as some opportunities of, hey, if you stay through the whole thing and learn something, you know, yep. go to our exhibit hall and you'll be entered to win these cool sneakers or you know, yep. some little tchotchke yep. that people want. Got it. So, um, Zoe, what about you guys? How do you guys uh, get your, your folks ready when they 
before they get here to Washington? So we start a couple weeks ahead of the event um, sending weekly email updates to folks, and that's mostly just like, how do you prepare for the Hill? What should you pack? Kind of a very 101 approach, especially for our folks who will be coming to DC for the first time. Uh, we also do a training webinar about a week ahead of the event. Um, and we also send um, an email right before folks show up in DC where we connect them via email with the teams of other advocates they'll be going to meetings with. And this will include information like, these are the talking points we're gonna cover. These are the member of members of Congress you might meet with and like links to bio, stuff like that. So if they want to, they can do some research ahead of time. We also do a much more in-depth um, training the day before we send folks to the Hill where we model a bunch of different things like, um, how the meetings generally go, especially again, for those first time attendees who might be nervous about meeting with a member of Congress for the first time. Um, we do a much deeper dive on our policy asks and we offer a lot of time for folks to sit with their groups and sort of practice their meeting flow before they head to the Hill the next day. Great. Um, Carlene, do you have any, you know, how do you get your folks ready before? I mean, yeah, I would. I mean, nothing different. I think than what's been said. I think the yeah. you know that focus on just kind of the focus for us because we have done things on a much smaller scale is you know being able to have a little more one on one with people and and I think um, you know both you folks also sort of spoke to it about just being able to be there for the like nervousness that people might have if it's the first time that they've actually done anything like this. So just leaving I think for me one of the things that I've paid attention to is like leaving space for that so that people can feel really confident. I would agree. We also try to, sorry, this is Zoe. Um, when we put together, especially our larger events, we try to always pair up returning experienced advocates with the first time folks. So that in addition to, you know, hearing from staff and in the training, sort of the, you know, don't be nervous, here are the tools to help perspective. This way they're directly paired with an experienced advocate, usually from their same state who can offer the perspective of someone who's been through it before. Okay. And Brittany, any you know, wise tips real quick on, on you know, education, anything that you've learned real fast? Uh, no, although I kind of have a question for the other panelists. So we use group leaders um, when we can, where we have a member of the staff, um, and I have to beg and steal other people from other organizations to help me be group leaders, um, so that they're with an expert. And I know that not everyone can has the capacity to do that, depending on how many groups you have but that can help things go uh, very smoothly as far as the um, education part is concerned. But I don't, it's actually kind of a question for everybody else whether you use utilize group leaders. Um, this is Zoe, we do that as well. Um, we try to always have a foundation staff member in all of the groups and um, that doesn't always happen, however. So when we can't provide a staff member for a group we have, we try to make sure that one of the advocates there has been, you know, the, has a lot of experience at the event. Um, but the thing we then run into is that we have to build into our preparation for the event a um, extra training for the staff because many of the staff who end up coming to this event and acting as team leaders aren't members of our policy team so they might be able to speak a lot to you know the foundation's fundraising work or our research or you know clinical trials etc but they might not feel like an expert on even something as simple as guiding their advocates around the hill so we just make sure we build in some extra time so those folks also don't feel nervous going into that that's great okay so Moving on a little bit, you, you, you made your plan, you've educated them, now they're here. So, you know, we got to rally them, we got to get them around the hill, we got to have leave, leave behind material, we've got, you know, uh, some net networking time. So, you know, KP, how, how, do you, how do you rally these folks? Like, do you have big speaker? How does that, how does that, they, they arrive now, you got these 5,000 people here, what, what kind of happens, what, what, what goes on? So we um, typically try to have a big name speaker to get them, you know, rallied up and fired up to go do things. Um, usually a member of an, the administration or we'll do a big keynote speaker that's a former member of the administration, such as John Kerry, or a really great, you know, keynote speaker like Malcolm Gladwell, who we had this year as well just someone who can, you know, really inspire them to go up and tell their story and maybe not give the credit union perspective, but give the perspective of someone who's really passionate about what they do. Um, cool. We also work closely with our individual state associations to do some additional briefings that are more state specific during our GAC. And 
we try to have a CUNA staff member there who, again, can, you know, just get them fired up of, hey, we're here in Washington. We got a bill passed last year. Let's go have something else great happen this year. So it's a yep. lot of re continuing education and being a cheerleader, essentially. Sure. So, Zoe, you, know, you got all these folks in town um, in the state capitol or here in Washington. How do you how do you navigate the hill? Like, how do you communicate? Is there a central location? How does that how does that all work? How do you communicate? Is it electronically or how you know, how do you get people so there is not people lost on the hill? Sure thing. Um, so one thing, one new thing we did this year was we are we always provided maps of the hill at large to our folks, um, but this year we supplemented that with a specific guide about how the room numbers work in all the different buildings, um, because you know that can be confusing even for our DC-based staff who don't go to the hill super frequently. So we got a lot of good feedback on even just that little simple addition. Um, but so we actually use a consultant to schedule all of our Hill meetings for our large yep. federal events. And as part of that, um, we collect the phone numbers of all of the designated team leads, whether they're foundation staff or um, experienced volunteer advocates. And so our consultant has this list of phone numbers and she's in constant communication with the teams over the course of the day. Um, everyone is sent out a, a, a really detailed schedule about where they need to be when, who they're meeting with, all of that. Um, and they're kind of in constant communication with our consultant where so that the offices are always aware, oh, so this group is coming, they're just five minutes delayed, or so-and-so is late, they've reached out to this person for help. So um, in addition to scheduling our meetings for us, she kind of acts as a mission control and making sure that everyone gets where they need to be. So an aggregator of information, but also a distrib distributing of information too. So everyone's kind of linked together. That's great. Yes. Mm -hmm. Carlene, you know, when you, after you guys leave your meetings, like what kind of leave behind do you leave? You know, you've gone in, you've done the meeting. What do you leave with that member of the, of the legislature or, or the staffer? What kind of material do you leave? What kind of leave behind collateral do you leave? Yeah, I mean, we've done, the way that we've done meetings is, you know, with the organizations that we've been working with. So, you know, we feel that the organizations kind of have the better material to leave behind. Um, the stuff that they'll leave is not is more depth on whatever we've talked about, but it isn't necessarily introducing a whole bunch of new issues, but more just reinforcing and deepening what we've talked about. I think when we're present at meetings as Lush, what we do and, you know, I think the role that we play is to sort of talk about the business case for whatever it is that we're advocating for. Um, and, you know, we don't often kind of leave a bunch of stuff behind as us, but we've, you know, looked at the stuff that the organizations have and feel like it speaks the case that we want to make. It's just being able to talk about both as a business that you know brings income into whatever the state or city and also generates employment for people that that's the you know that that's an important voice for folks to hear yeah that's great and so i guess to, to close it out is um Brittany, like you know they're, they're here you've got you've got folks how did how did is there time for networking is there time you know what how did because you know a lot of times the, you have people that come you know multiple times over the over the years is there a networking time? What do you guys do? Um, we have a lot of networking time. It is kind of like a big reunion um, for for both researchers and, and for our patient events. Um, for the researchers, a lot of times they'll end up uh, collaborating uh, later, which is kind of fun. Um, so we have a training the night before, and we are um, very cautious to start that early enough and give some dead time so that people can hang out from two to five, and then dinner starts at five, that kind of thing. Um, and then also we encourage people to exchange numbers um, with their group group leaders and, and their groups. And we also have a directory of everyone that attends that is open to everybody. So if you, know, you talk to somebody and you kind of remember their name but can't remember where they were from, you can go through the directory and try to find them. Yep. Okay. So that that's awesome. Um, and, and and really important too. I mean, you got folks that are in town. They're they, they become friends. They want that networking time. I think that's really critical to 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 make sure you have that time there. So the, the third kind of pillar is, is is you know maximizing impact offsite. So you you got folks here in in Washington or folks in the state capitol, but you also have got supporters off-site or, you know, digitally that can that can weigh in at the same time that you got people here. So I know, Carlene, you had some success doing that. 
um, in Sacramento. You had folks working uh, the state capital, but also at the same time using social media. Can you talk about that a little bit to maximize, amplify? Yeah. So, yeah, we had um, felt like the folks that we were pulling together to be able to do the inside meetings, and again, this is sort of in California, so smaller scale, um, that we could have you know, that we could make sure that the kind of, you know, quote unquote, like voices were being heard from the outside. So the event that we organized on the same day and at the same time that the meetings were happening um, was partially a rally and partially you know, a way to get support from folks that were just walking by. Um, yep. So we had our, you know, we just had fun stuff. We had tables set up. Um, and fabulously, we had Ben and Jerry's ice cream so that people you could stop on a hot Sacramento day. Um, but then engaging them in conversation and getting them to use their phones to take action to send the message like directly to the person that may be at that exact time meeting with somebody on the inside. Um, but I think it was a really it was a great way to have like two things going on at the same time. And for the scale of what we were trying to do, it was totally manageable and um, yeah, and generated like quite a bit of interest. So we got the media yeah. bump out of it as well. So you kind of bumped up above your weight, like you've got people on the ground mm -hmm. there, but you're also got people outside, you know, weighing in. So it seems bigger. Uh, I thought KP, you guys use, when you've got folks in town, you've also got, you know, folks that are back, back in the States, how are they how are they weighing in digitally? Um, we ask our folks back in the states to use the same hashtags that we are at the federal level when people are here in DC for fly-ins. We also encourage them to go the old fashioned route and pick up the phone and call their legislators or email them. So even if people can't make it to Washington DC, we're still sending them updates about how the GAC is going what's happening on the Hill, and we encourage them to get involved and take action. We also have started live streaming some of our big high profile GAC events on our Facebook page. And that's been really helpful in getting people to engage more with CUNA on social media. And from there, we're finding that they engage with CUNA on social, then they start engaging with our grassroots advocacy campaigns. Thanks, Kristen. So, uh, Zoe, can you talk about you know what what you guys do because it's a little you you guys have a big digital presence right outside and, and it really helps amplify. Can you talk about that a little bit? I can, yeah. So um, one facet of cystic fibrosis is that two people with CF, um, obviously who aren't related, um, can't really be in the same room as each other, right? Um, we have really strict guidelines um, to prevent cross infection between people with CF. So, you know, we are the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. Everything we do, we do for people with CF. So obviously um, we want to make sure that even though Unfortunately, only one person with CF can attend these events in person, that we are still carrying the voices of people with CF to Capitol Hill or to their state legislatures, right? So the online component of Phone to Action has been really critical for us in doing this. So we run concurrent campaigns um, for what we call online days of action um, at the same time as we are up on the Hill, right? So for instance, we had our, I'll talk about this more um, in my section later on, yeah. but you know, in our event we had a couple weeks ago, in addition to about you know 150 people who we had in person in DC, we had um, a ton, we had over, you know, 1,500 people from across the country use the online day of action tool to get in contact with their members of Congress as well. And we work really closely with um, a few people with CF who have high social media presences to um, promote the online day of action component of the event to their circles as well, so that we're ensuring that the voices of people with CF themselves are being heard just as much as the voices of their family members, friends, care teams, et cetera, who are up there carrying their stories for them. That's awesome. Thanks, Zoe. So, Brittany, um, I'm going to tie, tie it together a little bit. So, how do you amplify with your supporters from the Fox Foundation outside of, you know, when you're having a fly-in? And then how do you keep that momentum going at the end? So I guess it's a two-part question. Like, do you kind of do what the other folks were talking about? Um, and, and how do you keep that momentum going? Yeah, we, we definitely have a concurrent um, digital strategy with both of our events. 
As far as keeping it going, um, we follow up, we capture, we use phone to action to capture people's email addresses and um, phone numbers, and then we use that throughout the year to touch back and say, hey, you, you participated in this campaign. Um, I'm sure that you're also interested in this other campaign. And so uh, people come to our website, but I find that, that when we push out information, um, we get a better response. So we, we keep lists and we bug people uh, throughout the year. Great. So I guess I just want to ask all the panelists, is there any tips to keeping the momentum going? The, you know, you had a great fly-in, people are all fired up. Can anyone give us like 30-second tips or nuggets that our listeners could take away that you've learned? KP, do you, Kristen, do you have anything? Yeah, um, have a different ask each quarter. So it could be you've educated them and they came to the fly-in. The next quarter, maybe you ask them to send an email action alert or attend a town hall meeting. Um, the next time you send them something, you can ask them to fill out a key contact form and then figure out who they know or which legislators they have key relationships with. So it's keep the ask a little bit different each time you're asking your advocates to do something. That way they won't get as burnt out even if your bill's moving really, really slowly through the Senate, um, and yep. they'll still be engaged. So switch up the asks Great. every so often. Update the ask. Okay, Zoe, do you have any tips real quick? Or Carlene or Zoe, why don't we go with you first? Do you have any sure real thing. quick? Um, how do you keep the yeah. momentum? They've, they've left town, but you, you, they're energized or excited. What do you do? Um, I'm going to give two tips. So the first one is make sure you plan out your follow-up ahead of time. Um, talk about it very early on in your planning phase for the overall event um, so that it's well thought out and impactful. And also I'm going to point towards the bullet on the screen that says visits to the district office. Um, in district meetings are a great way to get even more people involved. Um, it's a much easier lift for a lot of folks than traveling to DC for an event um, and having relationships with district directors and district staff is a super effective way to build relationships with the members of Congress. Awesome. Carlene, do you have any quick tips on, you know, keeping that moment? You've, 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 you've got all these people there, they laugh, they're excited, they're passionate. Do you, how do you keep them engaged? Yeah, I think it's, um, you know, figuring out how to continue to continue to tell the same stories, but continue the momentum that you got with everybody but, and, and continue to kind of honor the interest that they had in the time. So you want to follow up with what's going on, but not making it, but finding that like balance between not making it like really boring, like a legislative update, but at the same time, knowing that they knew a lot about the issue, they showed a lot of interest and they want to know where it's going. So it's not kind of, yeah. so it, make, it makes sense to them why they're getting your update and why you're asking right. them what you're asking them to do. And make it feel like they made a difference by participating too, I guess is a good way to say it too. Um, all right, so let's let's really dig in deep. We, got, we, don't, we don't have a lot of time, but I'd really love to hear, you know, what you guys, you know, some of your case studies, you know, what you learned um, so why don't we start it off um, with Brittany and, you know, talk about your Researcher Hill Day last in, in February, uh, a couple couple months ago. You know, what was the goal? What were the, your great successes? What were the, you know, what was the overall outcome? And, and what did you learn? Could, you, could, we, uh, could we start with you, Brittany? Sure. Um, so just to give a little background really quickly, the Fox Foundation uh, is the world's largest nonprofit funder of Parkinson's-related research, and we funded about $900 million in research. So we're primarily a research organization, but we have a big patient contingency um, and also work with patient advocates. Um, so, you know, I've been talking about our patients versus our researchers. So we have, because we have these two constituencies, we decided to um, have two different Hill Days, one that's focused on researchers in the spring, um, which is what I'm going to mostly talk about, um, that focuses on appropriations because we feel like the uh, researchers are the best messengers of, um, you know, how federal money is, is spent. Um, and then we have, in the fall, we have a patient um, Hill Day that focuses on access to care and, and more patient-focused um, items. I've also seen other organizations do sort of a... Um, a combo where they have everybody come at once and they have a patient, a doctor, and a researcher all kind of telling the story at the same time. I think that works well too. Um, 
So if, you know, for people who are putting together their Hill Days, if they're trying to figure out, and they have they have multiple um, constituencies that they're dealing with, there are a couple of different ways to do that. And I, I happen to think they, they, both, they both work pretty well. Um, so for our February event, we had, it was a, our smaller one, um, we had uh, 40 researchers come in and we talked about appropriations um, for uh, primarily the National Institutes of Health, or NIH. Um, we had lawmaker meetings to talk about that, and um, I self-scheduled. I know that people have there are there are people out there that will do this for money. Um, we do use a vendor to schedule our much bigger event in the fall, um, where we have two to three hundred people. But for the forty people, we self-scheduled um, between me and, and two other folks, um, and it wasn't too difficult. You just have to be really organized. Um, and then pursuant to that, because patients are tend to be very engaged, we wanted to engage our patients and have them support the researchers, even though they weren't invited. Several patients demanded to come, and we said we're keeping this with, for researchers only. Um, and so we really needed a, a robust way to have them be involved. So we used uh, phone to action, um, and we sent out uh, an action alert saying, you know, email your member of Congress and tell them there are researchers on the Hill. And even though there's only 40, 40 of them, you know, there's there's thousands of us out here with the same message. Um, and it was pretty it was pretty successful. Um, yeah. The stats here, we had uh, 2,500 emails and about 100 tweets. So that what you're saying is is that you had really uh, really focused individuals, 40 of them on the Hill that are experts that are you know they're talking to the legislators. At the same time, you've got your supporters from around the country helping amplify their their message and helping support them at the same time. So it's kind of a uh, it's a it's a double effect at the same time. Exactly. Great. Okay. So another great uh, we have another great story um, from Zoe on on the nonprofit side. So what Zoe? Um, you know, at Cystic, Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, you know, what was your goal? You know, for your March seventh. Uh, event. What was you know? What were some of the great outcomes? What, are, what were the lessons learned? Sure thing. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, um, we do two federal advocacy events every year. Um, we do March on the Hill um, about this time every year, and then we also do one at the end of June called Teen Advocacy Day, which is focused towards kids, you know, 13 to 19 who usually have a sibling or increasingly a parent with CF. So different audience, but um, still a really cool way of conveying the message. Um, we, our goal um, for this event is, as always, to just raise awareness of CF. We're a pretty small patient group, um, so we're always out there to try to get more members of Congress aware of who we are and what our issues are. So we're always um, up on the Hill advocating for those policy priorities I mentioned earlier, uh, basically affordable, adequate health coverage. We also do a lot of um, asks for funding around the NIH and the FDA, so we're usually up there every year talking about that as well. Um, yeah. We had meetings with over 315 members of, uh, we had over 315 meetings on March 7th um, for our event, which is a number we're super proud of. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we are really proud of how we've been able to grow the sort of online advocacy component of this event with our online day of action. So, you know, in addition to 150 folks representing about 40 states, we had over 1,600 folks from all 50 states writing in um, at the same time, encouraging members of Congress to, you know, pay attention to the messages, to listen to stories of people with CF, that sort of yeah. thing. Um, what we're really proud of this year, I'll say, is we tweaked our training schedule a little bit to try to, um, because we have a number of folks who sort of come back continuously to this event who, you know, don't necessarily need the, you know, mock meeting, what does it look like to meet with a member of Congress session that the first time attendees do. So this year we played around a lot more with how we make the time and the training time most valuable for the really experienced advocates and talked there about sort of um, maintaining the momentum, right? How they can carry their advocacy home with them, continue building relationships with members of Congress in the district and continue to engage others from the community and their advocacy work as well. Yeah. It's a great all of the above strategy, right? You're engaging, you're, you're educating, you're engaging your folks out in the states, you're letting them know, hey, we got people coming in, it's just it's very smart and then after carrying over it with the momentum so that's congratulations uh so um kp with with cuna how did you get what was your goal i mean i, I know you've talked about it a little bit so but you 
for your March 10th, your weekly event or your week event on March 10th to the 14th. What did you guys, what was your goal? What were your successes? What are you really proud of? What did you learn? So our goal this year was to really push the uh, House and Senate to start looking at a national data security, cybersecurity law, rules, regulations, something. Because right now you have all 50 states, some of which are legislating their own, like California, and you still have a lot of hackers out there who want to do bad things. And I'm sure, as everyone knows, if you shopped at a certain unnamed store with a big red logo that looks like a bullseye, back in 2009, you got a new debit card. So we're trying to find, you know, policymakers we can work with to try and forward data security. So our goal was to kind of educate legislators as to what bad data security is doing to credit unions. You know, how much is this costing us? And in turn, how much is it costing the members of your district? So we flew in the 5,000 people and really worked on educating them about data security as well as other financial issues. And we also wanted to thank them for being for passing S2155 last year. Yep. which led to great regulatory relief for credit unions. Um, yep. One of the ways we helped them with this was having huge speakers this year. I mentioned Senator Kerry or former Secretary yep. Kerry earlier. Yep. We also had Vice President, Vice President Pence speak on Tuesday morning. So yep. it also made our credit unions feel great that, you know, we have members of the administration who support our mission because Pence was a friend of credit unions back when he was in the House. So that was yep. great for us. Um, what we've yeah. engaged in is from the main stage, we ask people, pull out your phones and text a short code, and then yeah. all of a sudden, we have 4,000 plus messages going to Capitol Hill saying, credit union members are here, we're going to see you in the next couple of days, please listen to us. Or That's when S2155 was working its way through the Senate, having, you know, 5,000 messages suddenly come in over, you know, a three-day period, the senators yep. are like, oh, you were just in, and now you're emailing me about this. Okay, let's move the bill forward. So yep. it was really it, helpful to have the phone to action tool where we could tell them, you know, not go back to your hotel and get on your computer, but hey, text us like you're texting your kids and then take action. Yep. So the live event was a huge success. You also had a great opportunity to thank legislators, which you know, it, 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 it impacts the people that were here so they could talk about it, be very thankful, very excited about it. And then you also had issues that they were very knowledgeable about. And then you got them to take an action. So that's a great, great way to um, for a trade association to, to leverage its membership. So um, on the corporate side, I'd love to hear, Carlene, you guys had a very successful legislator, legislative push um, with Senate Bill 1249. Uh, could you talk about that? really quickly and, and, and what was the goal, you know, how did, what, what did you learn and the successes from that? Sure, yeah, and, and quickly, um, you know, we were, we had been working with social compassion and legislation in California around the introduction and, you know, hopefully ultimate passage of 1249. and. So we've kind of been in the background a lot, you know, helping support it with some funding and, you know, just other things in the background. But certainly as the end of the session was approaching, people were concerned that there wasn't enough focus being put on the bill or that what we wanted to do, I think what the goal was, um, was to make sure that not just meeting with the folks in Sacramento, but that they also understood that there was a whole constituency behind them of people that cared about um, about getting animal testing out of cosmetics. So, you know, while all the meetings were happening sort of inside the state capitol, as I said, we sort of hosted this outside event. And I think in some, of, you know, the right picture, you can just see that people either walking by or that were invited to come either from the organization's list and, and um, members that that we were working with, or we did a call out to um, our local California, our folks that were local to Sacramento, to come out um, that day and just spend some time both at a rally and you know trying some product and getting some ice cream, and then when they were there, I mean just having that tool where they could do the same and you know text a short code and send a message directly to 
um, their legislator inside the building was incredible. So, you know, in combination, in a, in a really short amount of time, I think we really just pushed this out for a couple of days um, between the folks who are, you know, our customers on our California list and people who were there on the day, you know, sent close to 2,000 emails to the lawmakers in that really short period of time. So really wanted them to feel, feel that pressure. Um, so yeah, a combination yep. of People who were like local to Sacramento, and then we also use the online platform yeah. to reach out to California yeah. people um, and use a lot of it on social. Yeah, it sounds like like all of the above strategy worked really well for you. And using a timeline, using your employee base, using your customer base, and then just using people that care about the issues locally and letting them know when those certain pinpoints or pressure points you needed their support. Um, and, and really using that time, you know, appropriate time correctly. So congratulations on that. Um, we've got a couple questions uh, that I wanted to ask you guys from our from our from our listeners. Um, how do you? Ha the first question is: Is how do you handle the logistics of getting five thousand people to the hill? Um, you're, that, I guess that's for Kristen or KP from CUNA. How do you, how do you guys do that? I am very, very lucky because I have great um, league staff or state association staff in all 50 states and the District of Columbia. So the association staff works at scheduling the Hill meetings. However, if there's a member that's newer or that we don't have a great relationship with, then I will get pulled in or our federal lobbyists will get pulled in to help get those meetings scheduled. But we're very lucky because we have designated state staff that will get the meetings scheduled for us. And what we also do is plan into the government affairs conference schedule itself. You know, Tuesday afternoon, late afternoon, you can start having Hill meetings. Wednesday afternoon, that entire afternoon is dedicated to going to the Hill all day Thursday. And we also yeah. have a townhouse on Capitol Hill where people can go and just put up their feet in between meetings, which definitely cool. helps keep them on the Hill yeah. and not visiting Smithsonian's. Yeah, that's great. Okay, so I guess um, this is another great question. How do you measure improvement in a relationship with a congressional office or a member? So Zoe or, or uh, Brittany, you know, like you were talking about getting, you know, how do you measure that? How do you, how do you, how do you do that? Zoe or Brit Zoe, why don't you try to take a shot at that? You know, how do you measure, sure you thing. measure a success with a meeting or with a member? Yeah, yeah, I can give a good um, a good anecdote on that. So obviously, one measure of success is whether or not that member of Congress comes around and, and ultimately ends up voting with you, voting the way that you want, supporting the issues you're in there asking about. Um, in the spirit of full honesty, we have not gotten to that place with a lot of. Uh, some of our more difficult relationships with our members of Congress, but a good example of a way we've seen a relationship improve was um, we have this um, awesome set of advocates from Florida. They have a newer rep, um, and the first time they went in to go meet with him um, to say it went poorly is really an understatement. It was in that period of time when tensions were really high around healthcare um, back in early 2017. Um, uh, tears were shed, um, but they've continued to meet with him um, over the years, and he actually kind of on his own asked to come and tour our local chapter and their district recently and has expressed a big interest in getting to learn more about the community and, you know, getting to meet people who are impacted by CF in his district. So while you know, the voting record isn't necessarily what we would hope to see and what we continue to advocate for. Um, I think that really speaks to the power of continuing to go back and really try to build a relationship and try to find common ground. Um, and we've seen a real improvement um, in the last two years with that relationship. And we, we're hopeful that we can see it continue to improve as well. Great. So we have another great question. Um, how do you keep people engaged after the fly-in so they don't become a strong advocate, so they become a strong advocate for multiple causes and not just one issue? Um, does anyone want to take, take, a, take a shot at that? You know, how, how, do you, how do you keep them engaged? How do you make that stronger? For multi, so they, they're not just one single issue, you know, how do you, how do, you do that? KP, as a trade association, oh. you guys got multiple issues. Yeah, we have a lot of issues, and one way we do that is 
um, quite frankly, asking them what issues matter to them in our post-GAC survey, asking them what they liked, what they didn't like, and using those survey results to figure out, okay, yeah, they're interested in data security, but they're also really interested in housing finance reform. Let's keep them up to date on the latest housing finance reform developments. Um, as I said earlier, we change the asks depending on what's going on on the Hill. And we also work to get them engaged on state level issues that are similar or similar enough or casually related to the federal issues. So we yeah. ask them to yeah. do different things at different times of year, and we try to yep. find relationships between issues. Yep, that's great. Okay, so I'm gonna wrap this up, and the way I wanna do a fast round robin, and what I'm gonna ask you is, is if you had one piece, one quick 30 second tip that you could give someone that's running their first fly-in, what would that be? So why don't we start with, uh, why don't I start with Carlene? What would your one tip be in 30 seconds or less if, if, you, if someone's never run a fly-in? I mean, I think it, it, treat it like you treat any organizing piece, you know, just lay everything out on the table that you need to get done and figure out how it all comes together. Don't worry about the stuff that you have to worry about later. Worry about the stuff that you have to worry about initially and just keep taking all the steps forward. Perfect. Brittany, what would the uh, one tip that you would have? Um, my tip is don't panic. Things happen uh, that are outside of your control, and it's really no big deal, and I nearly promise that no one else is noticing. I've literally lost the, the president of an association that I worked for. I've misplaced wheelchairs. I've done all kinds of stuff that I think is like, oh, no, I'm going to get fired for this, and uh, either people didn't notice or they understand, and so keeping a calm, cool head in the middle of the hill day, sort of like your wedding, you know, kind of enjoy it, but also don't panic about it, um, is it will get you far. Perfect. Uh, KP, Kristen, Kuna, what would your, your <laughs> advice be? Uh, my advice is spend the most time preparing your advocates to tell their story instead of knowing the ins and outs of a policy. Um, you know, most people don't need to know the ins and outs of how the entire financial system works together. But if they can tell the congressman or congressman staff that, hey, this credit union helped me buy my first house. They helped me improve my credit through financial education programs. I never thought this would happen. I'm a first time homeowner. No, teaching them how to tell that story is going to be more impactful than teaching them the ins and outs of any policy that's currently up for debate on the Hill. So yep. really focus on helping people tell their story as opposed yep. to we support this long list of bills. Okay, that's great advice. You know, make it real. Okay, so Zoe, finishing strong, what, what's your, your, your 30 second piece of advice for anyone who's never run a, run a fly-in before? Uh, those are all excellent tips that were just given. KP, you took what I was going to share. So what I will share in addition to that is take some time during the training and teach your advocates how to have a difficult conversation, right? Give them the tools about how if they're asked a question they're uncomfortable answering or don't know the answer to, give them the tools and give them time to practice how to navigate their way out of that conversation and sort of just link it back to their personal story, why they're there, um, and not to get bogged down in the details. All right, that you guys, I can't thank you guys enough for this excellent, for all your hard work today and, and, and taking the time um, to, to educate our, our, our listeners and, and being great phone to action clients. Um, we want to thank everybody for listening. Um, for more information on how phone to action can help you influence public policy, our website is phone to action.com. Our phone number is 202 509. 9964, or you can email me at erosedahl at phonetoaction.com. Again, I'd really like to thank our panelists. You guys are excellent today. Um, if, if there are several more questions here, we can email you offline and send you the answers to those questions. But uh, thank you and have a great afternoon.